Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to our program on Kardec Radio. And now, here's our host, Dr. Vanessa Ancelone. Welcome, dear listener, to Kardec Radio. Today, the show is about the spirit is therapy for discarnate spirits. And we have a lot to share with you. We actually have a friend with us here, Adriano Barbo, the president founder of the Mount Vernon Spiritist Center in New York. And we have a lot to share with you because Kardec Radio is here to nourish your soul. Actually, just today, we've got to know of a most recent research that was released by the group of Dr. Michael King in England. Uh, he is a faculty of the Unit of Mental Health Sciences and a faculty of brain sciences at the University College London Medical School in the United Kingdom. He has just released the most interesting research talking about how much religious participation or belief may predict better mental health and the interesting result, and you can read more at the British Journal of Psychiatry, when he, they evaluated people who say they're religious, they believe in God, etc., they're spiritual, but they are not actually religious. They don't have a religious religion per se, which is quite interesting because he analyzed the data of more than seven thousand people who participated in this study in England and they found out that people who are spiritual but not religious are more prominent to be drug addicts to have eating disorders greater anxiety disorder phobia neurotic disorder and be addicted to psychotropic medication bottom line People who have a spiritual understanding of life in the absence of religious framework are more vulnerable to mental disorder. Dear listener, this is quite striking and and quite intriguing, we would say. And that's one of the reasons why we're here at Kardec Radio to share with you that there is much for us to know. And spiritism is a beautiful framework. It's a beautiful frame, religious framework because it brings to us structure for the mind, really to bring some balance. And that's the reason why we are here today with Adriano Barbo to talk more about the importance of adopting a discipline of the mind and of the heart. Let us not forget that Kardec Radio is also in good collaboration with our sister radio in Miami, Florida, coordinated by our friend Luis Salazar, web radio, Bezerra Online at Spiritist.com. They are streaming Kardec radio shows every day, sometimes three times a day, plus other beautiful segments by colleagues of ours in Portuguese and in Spanish. And it's a great way to listen to beautiful messages and discussions, conversations about the Spiritist precepts in English, Portuguese, and in Spanish. Right now at this very moment, in Sacramento, California, the United States Spiritist Council, together with the Brazilian Spiritual Healing Group, they are leading a conference, a seminar, a whole day seminar. Get to know more about it if you're in the area at spiritist.us, which is the website of the United States Spiritist Council, to get to know more about the information of the event. Also, in this show, we have the honor to announce to you we have a new segment coming up this show as we speak. We're going to stream it to you right before the interview with our friend Adriano Barbo. It's about a segment on the Spirit's Book. Sometimes people don't have time to read the Spirit's Book because there are 1,019 questions and answers. But here we are, giving them a hand. If you don't have time to read, you can listen to it at every show at Kardec Radio. Thanks to the, the friends, John DeRosa and Steve Shepard. They put together these beautiful segments. 
Let us listen to the first nine questions and answers of the Spirit book by Ellen Kardec. And then, if you want to know more about the book, just buy it in ebook format or in paperback at edisayofamerica.com. The Spirit's Book by Alan Kardec Chapter 1 God Question number 1 What is God? Answer God is the supreme intelligence, the first cause of all things. Question number 2 What is meant by the infinite? Answer That which has neither beginning nor end, the unknown. All which is unknown is infinite. Question number three. Could we say that God is the infinite? Answer. That would be an incomplete definition. Human speech is too impoverished and insufficient to define that which transcends human intelligence. Author's remarks for question number three. God is infinite in divine perfection. But the infinite itself is an abstract concept. Thus, to say that God is the infinite is to replace the thing itself with one of its attributes. It is to define something that is unknown by referring to something else that is equally unknown. Proofs of the Existence of God Question number four. Where may we find proof for the existence of God? Answer. In an axiom you apply to all your sciences there is no effect without a cause. If you would search for the cause of whatever is not the work of human beings, then reason will answer your question. Author's remarks for question number four. To believe in God, we need only to behold the works of creation. The universe exists, therefore it must have a cause. To doubt God's existence would be to deny that every effect has a cause and to believe that something could have resulted from nothingness. Question number five. All human beings have within them the intuitive sentiment of God's existence. What can we conclude from this? Answer. That God exists. Otherwise, where would such a sentiment come from if it were not based on something real? This is an application of the principle that there is no effect without a cause. Question number six. Mightn't our inner sentiment about the existence of God be the result of education and the product of acquired ideas? Answer. If that were the case, why would members of your primitive cultures have this intuition? Author's remarks for question number six. If the sentiment of the existence of a supreme being were only the product of education, it would not be universal. Like all scientific ideas, it would only exist in the minds of those who receive such education. Question number seven. Could we find the first cause of the formation of things in the innermost properties of matter? Answer. Even if you could, what in turn would be the cause of those properties? There must always be a first cause. Author's remarks for question number seven. To attribute the first formation of things to the innermost properties of matter would be to mistake the effect for the cause, since such properties are themselves an effect that must have had a prior cause. Question number eight. What about the idea that attributes the first formation of all things to an accidental combination of matter, that is, to chance. Answer. Another absurdity. How could anyone with any common sense believe that chance is an intelligent agent? Moreover, what is chance? Nothing. Author's remarks for question number eight. The harmony that governs the forces of the universe reveals certain set combinations and designs, and thus an intelligent power. 
To attribute the first formation of things to chance would be nonsense, because chance is blind and cannot produce intelligent results. An intelligent chance would no longer be chance. Question number nine. Where may we see in the first cause a supreme intelligence superior to all other intelligences? Answer. You have a proverb that says, The workman is known by his work. So look at the work and you will find the workman. Pride is what creates disbelief. Human pride believes in nothing above itself. And that is why people think they are so powerful. Poor beings. A mere breath from God could blow them over. Author's remarks for question number nine. We judge the power of an intelligence by its works. Since no human being could create what nature produces, it is obvious that the first cause must be an intelligence superior to humankind. Whatever may be the marvels accomplished by human intelligence, such intelligence itself must have a cause. The greater the results, the greater the first cause must have been. No matter what name you give it, that intelligence is the first cause of all things. We will return to our program after these messages. A new masterpiece has just been released by Edisei of America, Memoirs of a Suicide by Yvonne Ferreira. Under the guidance of the spirit Leon Dennis, the spirit author Camilo Castello Branco, using the pen name Camilo Candido Botelho, describes to the medium Yvonne A. Ferreira his dreadful experience after discarnated by suicide. The book entails invaluable instruction, demonstrating the greatness of the divine mercy toward repentant suicides and providing them with the opportunity to understand the universe and life in its fullest dimension. The beginnings of planet Earth, the evolution of the human being, the immortality of the soul. Christ conscious morality and other relevant themes are presented for the understanding that no attempt at moral growth will work if we remain imprisoned in self ignorance. A completing of this work shows that there is a road of reconstruction for those who repent. There is always hope because rehabilitation is possible. Buy your copy today at www.edisayofamerica.com Kardec Radio, live every Saturday at 11 a.m. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. The International Spiritist Council is organizing and promoting the 7th World Spiritist Congress, which will be held in Havana, Cuba, on March 23rd through the 25th of 2013. The Congress theme will be Charity and Spiritual Education in Building a World of Peace, 150 Years of the Gospel According to Spiritism. For more information, please visit number 7 C-E-M dot org. And now we return to our program. So we are here, dear listener, to talk about a most important topic. Something that is really becoming aligned with mainstream psychotherapy in the psychiatric hospitals in Brazil. It's the Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirits. And we're going to rely upon mainly three books to discuss this, which is Chapter 23 of the Medium's Book by Ellen Kardec and the short book that you can get a hold of at the website of the Spiritist Son of Baltimore, Getting to the Light, Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirits, by Devaldo Franco's cousin and also co-founder of the Mission of the Way in Brazil, Nilson de Souza. Pereira. He is a spirit psychotherapist and he has written this amazing book that is a beautiful summary about the ins and outs of this amazing technique that can reach out to those who are suffering from spiritual obsession. And the third book that can also be a reference for us is Obsession by the Spirit 
Manuel Filomena de Miranda through the mediumship of Devaldo Franco. Also, you can get a hold of it at the website of the Spiritual Society of Baltimore. And we are here with our friend, Adriano Varbo, President and founder of the Mount Vernon Spiritist Center, who is here with us today at Cardiac Radio to talk about this beautiful way of reaching out to others who are suffering. Thank you so much, Adriano, for being with us today at Cardiac Radio. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm very happy to be here with you. I really appreciate your kindness to invite me to collaborate a little bit that I can give. Adriano, thank you for being here. And as we're talking about, obsession is something that is striking many lives, bringing lots of problems, a lot of confusion, and people are not fully aware of it and even how to treat it. So, for example, in the book, Obsession, Divaldo Franco brings a message from Dr. Miranda when he tells about this girl who is just 15 years of age and suddenly she shifts her whole attitude becomes schizophrenic and she's taken to a psychiatric hospital. It's something that is more familiar to many people nowadays than we imagine, right? In the works you do at Mount Vernon Spiritual Society, you can tell how many people are struggling with such types of spiritual influence. Yeah, it is very common. And uh, I think one of the problems is that many families, many people doesn't recognize that when they are being influenced, they're teenagers, or in the case of that, that girl that was influenced by the spirit, it happens in many other families, but the family doesn't recognize that they are under the influence of the, the spirits, and uh, they don't know how to treat them correctly. And in the spiritual center, we have the help of the psychotherapists that helps the spirit. And in the Mount Vernon Spiritual Center, we've been helping a lot of families with this kind of problem. So, Adriano, this excerpt of the book Obsession, this case was relieved by the intervention of Dr. Bezerra de Menezes in the spiritual realm, together with a group of mediums and spirit psychotherapists in the center. So, we're talking about the spiritist therapy for the discarnate spirit. So, what is exactly a spiritist therapy for the discarnate spirits? Basically, it's it's a conversation that we have with the discarnate spirits for the meeting, but there's a lot of techniques that we learn through training, through studying spiritism that we use in this dialogue, in this conversation with the spirits. Basically, um, we have to use all the, the spiritist teachings and all the love we can have, we can evolve in ourselves, and basically involves all this. Exactly. We just want to listen to an excerpt from the book by Nilson Pereira, Getting to the Light, Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate, when he brings us like this historical perspective, not something new that only in spiritism is done, something that he tells comes from ancient times. Let us listen to this and then we make some comments about it. The Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirits It's a psychotherapeutic technique that has been used through the ages and applied on behalf of the troubled discarnate spirits. In ancient Western sanctuaries, significant spiritual interventions were used to help disturbed and troublemaking spirits, removing them away from the incarnate beings whom consciously or not those discarnate spirits used to torment. Jesus, when facing unhappy spirits from beyond the grave, acted as a supreme psychotherapist, persuading them to change their behaviors, elucidating them and making them aware of of ignoble acts they had practiced in the past. Jesus often conversed with those tormented, tormenting spirits, demonstrating to them his sublime qualities. His disciples later kept up with the ministry, abiding by the lessons they had been taught and applying these lessons with the wisdom and love to help troubled and hateful spirits. Allan Kardec, the remarkable codifier of the spirit's doctrine, drew from advancing psychology and other sciences to offer resources and guidelines that helped us understand the reality of the spiritual world. Those resources and guidelines are invaluable for us to understand and help those discarnate spirits who fool themselves and continue to carry grudges and injuries even after the death of the physical body. Through Spiritism, 
we become aware that the genesis of the whole process of human suffering, the afflicted individual is always the one responsible for his or her own achievements and downfalls. So Adriano, in this case, as Nilsson said, obsession is something that happens since ancient times because it's about spirit attachment and this spirit release therapy that we call the spiritist therapy for discarnate spirits or this obsession is something that uh, humanity needs to embrace sooner than later to relieve people from their mental maladjustments because our, our psychiatric system is really failing to talk about it. Yes, in the book, uh, Between Two Words, Manuel is reporting uh, many cases of schizophrenia through other mentors that explain to him about schizophrenia, and he tells that uh, there's a physical schizophrenia that basically that the, the psychiatric hospitals work on, but also there is the spiritual one that really is the one that is more addressed in the psychiatric hospitals that use the spiritist teachings uh, prides to work on and to have more success to help the patient, we have to address both of them. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, difficult to treat the patient and have success on uh, on his behalf. Exactly. People may be asking now, like, why do we care? Why do we care in that regard? And I recall reading from this very book, The Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirits, and many of Andrea Lewis' books, too, Chico Xavi, they talk about that the spirits were obsessing. When they go through the spirit conversation, as you said, the psychotherapist of the spirits talking to them, they may reincarnate better. Is that right? Yes, it is true. So um, after this, uh, you know, psychotherapy help with the spirit, he may relieve his anger, uh, his hatred, and may come to a new reincarnation uh, in a better position to succeed in his trials. Exactly, because as you were saying, it's funny because nowadays we see some kids that they are born and sometimes as if they were carrying a load of anger on their shoulder. Probably these are cases in which they didn't have that opportunity but had to reincarnate and now we're going to have to fix it while in an incarnation. But this can save a lot of headaches for the future reincarnations, as you're saying, right? Oh, for sure, and can have uh, can help a lot of families. Manuel Fulmenimir, and through his many books, he reports many cases uh, of obsession in childhood. Even kids of five, three, and uh, eight years old, they come a lot of obsession and can be in prevented before they incarnate through the spiritual therapy for them. Exactly, that makes a lot of sense to us. The other question many people ask, Adriana, in that regard, because just so we understand better, the dynamics of this work, they want to know more. And recently there was this movie, The Film of the Spirit. It's already being sold at Amazon.com, etc. They show like type of this obsession. Meaning. Can you tell us more about the dynamics of the meeting so the listener who has never been at these meetings can picture it? How does it work? this conversation? There's a lot of things involved in this process. Basically, um, we first have to have the meetings, which is the, the, the person that has those extensive uh, faculty to communicate with the spirits. That's the basic of the meeting, otherwise you cannot communicate with the spirits and more. So we set up a day in a week, could be any day or any hour or any time that okay. in the spiritual center. Don't try it at home, please. <laughs> <laughs> because the spiritual center, as we know, is a, is a place that we can, we all do the activities and there's, there's a, a spiritual field prepared for this. Uh, and then protection, right? protection. The protection. There's spiritual protection there much more than in our homes. And uh, it's like a hospital, spiritual hospital for the spirits. And that's the right place for this meeting. So we set up a time in a week and we should be very disciplined in hour, in time, not getting late or miss the meetings. And a lot of studs to know how to, to work there. And we collect and we you know get together when we are the prepared. It requires like a medium, a yeah. support medium and a spirit psychotherapy. Yeah, so in this eight or ten people you know, depending on the, the spiritual center. In our case, we have seven people. And uh, we have the meeting, which is uh, through psychophony, from the communication with the spirit. And then we have the counselor, 
Which we call like the speaking medium. Yeah, we speak in the medium, which is the person who is the person who will talk with the spirit through the medium. With the you know, it's the psychotherapist we would say in that in that word that will talk with the spirit. And then we have the supporting mediums, which are the ones that may help with a vibration with a prayer when the spirit is communicating or will help applying or giving passes uh, uh, to the medium to help him absorb all the energy which he absorbs in contact with the spiritual realm, especially those suffering spirits. It's not only that. In general, in the spiritual world, happens a lot of more. Usually, a meeting like this starts before it materializes in a real time, because the the medium usually uh, is it's the person who's more in contact with the spiritual realm, and the spiritual mentors of the house of that person of that medium will bring a suffering spirit to follow him during the day before to have more affinity or match with his energy. So in the in the moment of the meeting, it flows much more easily than just bring him in the, in the time there. And after the meeting, when you go to sleep, especially at night, so it happens more. So from our uh, detachment from the body in the moment of sleep, we go to the spiritual world and the works continue to its obsession or helping suffering spirit in their spiritual realm. And in many cases, uh, still in another day or in a week, the spirit will continue to follow the meeting to see if what he told him in the spiritual meeting, suffering moments, he is trying to put it in practice in everyday life. So, Yeah, that's very so. intense. But one of the questions that people often ask is, why do we care about the to help the discarnate spirits in regard, like, couldn't the superior spirits do it by themselves. How exactly, in a spiritual sense, we can understand the main reasons why it needs to be that way? Well, there are many reasons that we are uh, willing to help the spirits. First of all, is that when we get aware of the suffering, not only of the spirit in the spiritual realm, and as well the person, the incarnate person, we, you know, raise compassion inside of us, and we are willing to help. And that's one of the reasons that we help them. We want to help. We are compassionate towards their suffering. And the mediumship meeting is one of the best ways to help, you know, to alleviate the incarnate one in the spirit that is in, in the process of suffering in the spiritual realm. And uh, as well because in the, in the mediumship meeting, so the, the spirit the, that, you know, directs the spiritual work in the spiritual center, they bring the suffering spirits or the obsessors uh, in a meeting so we can help them. And why they bring them instead of helping them in the spiritual world? It's sure that they can help them without ourselves, but it requires much more of them. Uh, one of the reasons that we can say is because the suffering spirit and the obsessors, they vibrate so low that they cannot see or perceive the help that is around them. When they get in contact with us, that our vibration is more, it's more towards their vibration, so they can hear ourselves through the mediumship instrument, that is the, the medium itself. And the medium itself, itself emanates a kind of vibration in that will help him to understand the process that he is coming through. Sometimes uh, the, the help is around them. Peers are trying, you know, I need a doctor, I'm sick, I'm suffering. And we say to them, you know, uh, just let's pray a little bit now. And then when we start praying, because the pray brings that higher vibration, they raise a little bit their vibration, and then suddenly they say, you know, I can see now my grandfather, a doctor, a therapist, he a nurse. Because why they they suddenly saw them? It's because they, they rose a little bit their vibration through the talk they have with the, the psychotherapist or the counselor in the spiritual meeting and then got help from the spiritual world. If we didn't have that meeting, it would be more difficult for the spirits to bring help to them. They are willing to help them, but they don't have they don't offer a room, this vibration, to allow uh, the spirits to help them. In, in that sense, the mediumship offers that opportunity for the suffering ones. Uh. As you're saying, reminds us of uh, cases in the book Heaven and Hell by Alan Kardec, when he reports in the second part several spirits who were suffering or who were in need of help, or they were not, but they felt that by the time they were talking 
through a medium to a psychotherapist, like in this case, we would say spirit psychotherapist or counselor, someone like Kardak, they received some relief. And because they were elaborating their ideas and they were also being prayed for. So as you're saying, reminds of this case that now we're going to listen. An excerpt from the book, Heaven and Hell, by Alain Kardec. Part 2, Chapter 7. A Bored Spirit. Bordeaux, 1862. This spirit presented itself spontaneously to the medium, demanding prayers. And Kardec began his question. What has led you to demand our prayers? I'm tired of wandering around aimlessly. Have you been in such a situation for a long time? About 180 years. What did you used to do on earth? Nothing good. What is your status among other spirits? I am among the bored ones. Hmm. But that does not comprise a category in and of itself. Amongst us, everything comprises a category. Every sensation finds its similar, and sympathetic counterparts band together. Since you were not condemned to suffering, why have you remained for so long without progressing? I have been condemned to idleness, which among us is suffering. Anything that is not a joy is suffering. So have you been forced to remain errant against your will? There are causes too subtle for your material intelligence. Oh, try to explain them to me. It will be a beginning for you to become useful. Since I have no terms for comparison, I couldn't. An extinguished life on earth bequeaths to the spirit who has not profited from it what fire bequeaths to paper that it has consumed. Sparks, which recall what the still compacted ashes used to be and where they came from, that is, the destruction of the paper. These sparks are the remembrance of the earthly ties that bind the spirit until it has dispersed the ashes of its body. Only then does the spirit regain itself as an ethereal essence and desire to begin progressing once again. What might have caused the boredom you complain about? The consequences of my existence. Boredom is the child of idleness. I didn't know how to employ the lengthy years I spent on earth, and the consequences have been reflected in this world. Can spirits like you, who are wandering prey to boredom, emerge from such a state if they want to? No, they cannot always do so because boredom has paralyzed their will. They are suffering the consequences of their existence. They are useless and wanting of initiative and seek no help from each other. They are left to themselves until the weariness of their idle state makes them desire to change it. Then, at the slightest awakening of their will, they find support and good counsel to assist them in their efforts to persevere. Could you tell me something about your earthly existence? Alas, very little. You must understand, boredom, uselessness, and idleness result from laziness, which in turn is the mother of ignorance. But didn't your previous lifetimes enable you to improve? Yes, all of them, but very slightly, since they were reflections of one another. There is always progress, but it is so imperceptible that we don't even notice it. Why are you waiting for a new existence? Would you be willing to come to me more often? Evoke me. I will be constrained to come. You will render me a service. Can you explain why your handwriting changes so frequently? Because you ask a lot of questions. That tires me, and I need help in order to write. And then, the medium's guide explains. It is mental effort which tires him, and which obliges us to help him so that he can respond to your questions. He is as idle in the spirit world as he was on the earth. We brought him to you in order to attempt 
to pull him out of his apathy and boredom, which is true suffering and sometimes more painful than the acute pain would be because it can prolong itself indefinitely. Can you imagine the torment of the perspective of endless boredom? Most of the spirits, most of the spirits of this category look for earthly existence only as a pastime and as a means to break the unbearable monotony of their spirit life. That is why they frequently enter their earthly lives without any defined resolution to foster the good. And this, in turn, obligates them to start all over until finally true progress is felt. We're going to go to a short break. And when we come back, we have more about the spirit psychotherapies for discarnate spirits. We will return to our program after these messages. Kardec Radio, live every Saturday at 11 a.m. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. In Life Goes On, in an inspiring novel by the spirit author Andrea Luis, this book is a spirit's description of the individual after discarnating, and it shows that the life of the inhabitants of the beyond are related to their mental state. In a novel with 26 chapters, it tells the story of real characters who, upon discarnating, receive the help of spirit friends. These friends encourage them to renew themselves through study and work in order to prepare them to reveal their lives and understand schemes of the past, thereby enabling them to follow new directives of behavior. This volume teaches us the practice of self-examination in a certainty that, in conformity with the laws of God, life continues full of hope and labor, progress and accomplishment after death. Buy your copy today at www.edsayofamerica.com. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. Spiritism for Everyone, the online study of the Spirit's Book and the Gospel According to Spiritism. Spiritism for Everyone meets every Wednesday evening and Saturday morning using the latest technology in web conferencing. You can join in from any computer in the comfort of your home or office, no matter where you are in the U.S. or the world. Spiritism for Everyone is open, free, and requires no registration. To access the web live meetings, go to www.spiritus.us. Spiritism for Everyone is a program of the United States Spiritist Council. And now we return to our program. We are back with more about the Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirit. We are here talking with our friend, Adriano Barbo, who is also the president and founder of the Mount Vernon Spiritist Center in New York. If you want to know more about the center, it's www.mvscenter.org. Adriano, we were talking before the break about this case from the book Heaven and Hell and how prayer can be often very important to relieve these minds of these earthbound spirits that are obsessing other people. In this book also by Nelson Pereira, Getting to the Light, he talks about three other techniques, hypnosis, regression of memory, and spiritual medicine. Let us listen to these short excerpts from this book, and then uh, you can explain us more about these techniques. If the unrepentant collector persists, the spiritual psychotherapist can, in some cases, try the application of hypnosis. This requires the therapist to lead the obsessor back into time and space so that the troubled spirit can realize that whatever hurt him or her in the past was not a purely isolated event. The cause is the fact inscribed within him or herself when in the past existences he or she became a debtor because of his or her own ignoble actions. The therapist can also help the obsessor return to the memories of his or her own past mistakes. By doing so, 
This troubled spirit will realize that continuing the insane persecution of the incarnate enemy would only worsen the situation. Continuing with the obsession would only transfer to another phase of life something that could be solved through a moment of dialogue. It is relevant to consider that many troubled spirits can carry ideoplasmic diseases that injure them. Thus, they present themselves as someone sick and pitiful. In those cases, the spirit psychotherapist must use spiritual medicine. If the situation is grave enough, the spirit counselor may induce the application of imaginary needles so that the sick spirit will have the opportunity to see their shape and consequently feel the effects. So Adriano, here we were, Nilson Pereira is revealing to us different techniques that can be used by the spirit psychotherapist in a obsession meeting to relieve the obsessing mind. In this case, can you explain us more how these techniques he said, hypnosis, regression, and medicine work? There are many cases that we use those techniques, especially when the spirits are reluctant to accept their realities. Uh, what's going on with them. He mentions the first that uh, sometimes we induce the spirits to remember some cases in the past to help him realize his situation. It may happen in a case that a, a spirit is still thinking that he is incarnate. He didn't think that he's uh, in a bad situation in, in the spiritual world. And then we have to induce him come back to uh, some time in which he got sick, went to the hospital, and really... Uh, lost his physical body and then he realized that sometimes now I see that I'm not in the physical realm anymore because we induce him back in this memory he could recollect facts that he in that moment he wasn't uh, able to remember by himself one of the techniques that sometimes we use in following this same thought it happens sometimes with the obsessors especially with the obsessors because the obsessors, they usually think that they are the only victims and they want to revenge against the incarnate person and they think that they are suffering injustice. In this case, we induce as well, with the help as well, with the spiritual realm for sure, that he comes back to previous lives and the root of that problem. And then it helps the spirit to see that in the previous lives he was the person that started the whole thing and then it perpetuated from many reincarnations. That there are some cases that it really started many lifetimes before, maybe 300 years back. And uh, through that induction, he could realize and see that he wasn't that victim. He was uh, instead sometimes the person that caused the whole problem. And the hatred was that he was holding it wasn't that you know uh, real in the sense that he wasn't the victim, and then helps him a lot to to solve and for, and come sometimes many cases comes forgiveness because he realized that you know, he needs to forgive, and the root was far back and he used that a lot of time too and in other cases uh, of he mentions that the medicines or the needles. Sometimes it's the suffering spirit, the sick ones that they say, I'm not suffering a lot of pain, I cannot hold it anymore. Can you give me a medicine or something? That I... And then we say, yes, uh, there is a you know, tablet or aspirin or something in your side, you can drink it, so it, you're going you're gonna to feel relieved because it's a medicine. If there's a doctor or nurse beside you that will apply you or give you a uh, injection, and then you're gonna feel bad because it's a medicine, and they really see and they feel that they are receiving that injection. The spirit really feel better, and it's, and it's interesting how it works mm -hmm. because it does work. The spirit says, "Now I, I really feel better. This injection has a lot of good in it," and that's the ideoplastic uh, thing that the the, the Nielsen tells because the psychotherapist is not only telling the spirit that he needs that injection or, or saying the words, the psychotherapist really needs to help with his thought. And he says, there is a doctor in your side. We got to think that there's a doctor there or, or there's a needle or there's a medicine beside you, a water. Sometimes the, the person needs a water. The spirit actually needs a water. And we say that it's a cup of water beside you. You can drink it because it's going to help you. 
the counselor needs as well to have a strong thought in this direction to help the spiritual world to create the object that may help the spirit. In this case, you're talking about ideoplasty, and Kardec talks about it in the book Genesis when he says that our thoughts create forms, what he says like thought forms, and they stick around us. So we need to rely on that to help the spirits. But who can be a psychotherapist? Can anyone, Adriano, be a psychotherapist? What would be the requirements to be a psychotherapist? Because Nilson Pereira, he clearly says in one of the pages that we need serenity, inner harmony, and knowledge of spiritism. What else? Anyone can be, but there's no restriction to say you can't. But there's a lot of requirements to be a, a one that w will certainly help. Would then you say there is need like for preparation, like there's, training? There's training, there's preparation, because there are some irresponsible people that they may say, I, I can't do it. They certainly can, you know, make it, but they will suffer the consequences by not being trained, by not being responsible for their act. To be a really spiritist one, you got to be a knowing the spiritist teachings and get trained for it. It's, it's like being a psychotherapist on earth, it's not just picking one in the street and in an open office and call for people to help them. It's a dialogue it's, with the spirits. We get to know the spiritual laws. If the person has never heard about a plastic thing, he wouldn't think that it would be possible for the spirits to see a needle or, or something else helping him in the spiritual world. We get to know all those things to really see that they are truly happening and they really believe and are sure that it's happening. And plus, you get to know the consequences by talking to the spirits, uh, the responsibility that involves on it. He can harm himself by attracting even the, the bad spirits to himself and cannot bear the consequences of it. So in this case, you are talking about caution and challenges of doing this work. So it's not for anyone. Let's just give a short break when we come back. We're going to tell more about the importance of preparation and the possible challenges of this work. We will return to our program. A new masterpiece has just been released by Odyssey of America, Memoirs of a Suicide by Yvonne Ferreira. Under the guidance of the spirit Leon Dennis, the spirit author Camilo Castello Branco, using the pen name Camilo Candido de Botelho, describes to the medium Yvonne A. Ferreira his dreadful experience after discarnated by suicide. The book entails invaluable instruction demonstrating the greatness of the divine mercy toward repentant suicides and providing them with the opportunity to understand the universe and life in its fullest dimension. The beginnings of planet Earth, the evolution of the human being, the immortality of the soul. Christ's conscious morality and other relevant themes are presented for the understanding that no attempt at moral growth will work if we remain imprisoned in self-ignorance. A completing of this work shows that there is a road of reconstruction for those who repent there is always hope because rehabilitation is possible. Buy your copy today at www.edgesayofamerica.com. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. Now in English, the book Action and Reaction by the spirit Andrea Louise, psychographed by Chico Xavier. Buy your copy online or via your ebook reader. Go to www.edicefamerica.com today. The International Spiritist Council is organizing and promoting the 7th World Spiritist Congress, which will be held in Havana, Cuba, on March 23rd through the 25th of 2013. The Congress theme will be Charity and Spiritual Education in Building a World of Peace, 150 Years of the Gospel According to Spiritism. For more information, please visit number 7 cem.org And now we return to our program.
We're back here talking about the spiritist therapy for discarnate spirits, a beautiful way to relieve the spiritual pressure for many people's lives and also relieving the hearts of the earthbound spirits who are challenging our lives. They also need a break because they're children of God because when we discarnate, we keep on being human beings in spite of not having the physical body. Adriano, this is almost like spiritual surgery. So as you were talking earlier about the need of training and preparation, knowledge, to participate in a team of this obsession, being a spirit psychotherapist or a counselor of the spirit, you need to prepare a lot to participate into this surgical moments of the mind that is being treated. Correct? Yes, and it is very true that we need a lot of preparation. Usually it takes a lot of time. In our case, since we founded our spiritual center, we have been prepared. We took about more than four years previously studying the spiritism itself. Medianship. And the mediumship, there's, you know, we can, you can say here the mediumship book that we studied from the beginning to the end, the whole thing that happened there, and other books related to mediumship. We studied all this. Plus, we got to know that there has to be a lot of uh, affinity uh, between the, the members of the meeting because that helps a lot. Uh, it's not just getting a uh, medium from another center, another place, and get to a meeting. So the, 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 the members of the mediumship meeting should be very linked to one another for a lot of time. They get to resolve their difficulties, their conflict that may happen previous to this. So... In the moment of the mediumship, they are all aligned in thought in the same project and that their vibration will be more unified and that counts a lot in the mediumship meeting. If it just happen from day to night, you know, just a week preparation, so on like this, it won't work because all the people, they are thinking differently. They don't have the same thought. They didn't learn the same things that they studied together. And this preparation takes long time, you know, in our case, it took more than four years. All the members are working together. They are working the same projects. They are studying the same teachings together. To if if there is a, a different thought, why they have this doubt here, and work all together. In so the you're moment, talking the about the need of trust, harmony, and trust amongst the members, yes. without which this work is not going to be made. Yes, imagine a mediumship meeting. The concert is really counseling the spirit and then there's a member that doesn't agree with it. They start vibrating in different thought and will for sure uh, will just start very much the meeting. So everyone in the meeting should be in the same thought, in the same harmony, and it does acquire through time, experience, stud all together. So you're talking about the fact that this preparation is needed because there are many challenges. One of the main challenges you briefly already explained and we'd like to know more is about the fact that if you don't walk the talk as a spirit psychotherapist, you're in trouble. Yes, we are in trouble. It already happened in our mediumship. The, the medium comes and tells us, I, I'm really not prepared for today because I had a bad day. I, I just got angry here and there. It's what happens in our daily life, but we see that when we are out of balance, it's already we see the consequences in, in, in our own life right there because we are dealing with the spiritual vibration of spiritual is realm that spirits are linked to us and we are out of our balance we are going to suffer it in our daily lives and we see it uh, we we can we can uh, make a comparison with uh, a person you know uh, a psychiatrist or a nurse or someone working with the sick people imagine if he or she is not prepared she's going to suffer it, you know the contact with those sick uh, and ill people that he was supposed to take care of them. Exactly. And then to finalize this moment of reflection, I uh, would like to bring the case of Chico Xavier. Chico Xavier received messages from many illuminated spirits, but throughout his 75 years of mediumistic practice, he also served as a medium of suffering spirits. He allowed the spirits to come through him, speak. And Arnaldo Rocha, who recently discarnated, and God bless his heart as well, he served as a spirit psychotherapist for all those spirits who were suffering, who were challenging, 
and came through Chico Xavier to relieve their pain. Much like Divaldo Franco as the medium receiving spirits in these obsession meetings, and Nilson Pereira, the author of this book we mentioned all along the show, being the spirit psychotherapist. So, Adriano, people sometimes have this preconceived idea that good mediums only receive messages from good spirits. That's mistaking, right? Because the true mediumship is the one that serves not only the incarnates, but the discarnates. Oh, yeah, it's really true. People have this misconception, and uh, it, he may be obsessed by having this kind of idea because the, the real medium, he is a tool for the suffering spirit. And we see that majority of our meetings is towards helping the suffering spirits. They will give uh, their body for the, the obsessors, for the suffering ones. And let's say in a mediumship meeting that happens like, let's say, two hours, maybe 90 or something percent will be dedicated only to the suffering spirit to, the, to give the, uh, uh, the opportunity for them to communicate. And maybe just a little bit of the mentor will give us a message or writing that will help us, that will orient us toward helping the suffering spirits, not just making a, a mediumship meeting and wait for the good spirit uh, to communicate through us, if not that, because uh, we have a lot of books that they write through the other mediums that we have around us. If we want to contact with them, just read a, a good book, and, and it's not through the, the mediumship. It does happen. The illuminated spirits will come, but not you know the, the whole time of the mediumship meeting. It's just a fraction of it. You're right, Adriano. So we thank you very much for being with us at Kardec Radio today. We hope to have you more often. Thank you very much. Have a blessing day. Thank you. So, dear listener, here we are. And if you want to know more about this very book, there are so many spiritist books that are good and good references. But this book, Getting to the Light, The Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirits by Nilson de Souza Pereira, is the book it summarizes the ins and outs of it. If you want to have a picture of it, just watch the film of the spirits produced by TV Mundo Maior from Brazil. You can probably get a hold of it at Amazon.com. If not, just email cardacradio at gmail.com and we'll be able to assist you where to find these resources. So, dear listener... I know some of you have questions and you are in the screen room of Cardiac Radio. We are going to talk to you during the break. And after the break, if you have a question, we're here to answer your question. Followed by the beautiful segments by Dr. Marco and Joyce Magalhães. They're going to talk about the Spiritist view on a funeral. As we're talking about uh, death and discarnation and the continuation of life. As well as by the beautiful segment about the gospel and spiritism by our friend uh, Luis Sergio Marota, followed by a break. Kirsten Mello is going to talk about a uh, facet of the law of reproduction. It's actually about the spiritist view on polygamy. And then we end the show with a beautiful segment about how to teach the joy of giving to children with Bernadette Liao and wrapped up by the beautiful song They Leave, put together by James Marota, telling about the continuation of life. But stay there, because if you have a question, you can either write to us at the chat room of Kardec Radio, blog talk radio slash Kardec Radio, or you can call us at 858-769-4705, or Facebook us at facebook.com slash Kardec Radio, and we are here for you. Of course, if you have questions, suggestions for other shows, we also are available at cardacradio.com. We have a contact, contact uh, form. You can write your suggestions and questions. And by the way, we thank everybody who has been sending us suggestions and questions. And pretty soon, we're going to have a, an open session where Cardac Radio responds to all of your questions. Spiritism has an answer for everything that you ask. No wonder Kardec brought us the Spirits book, 1,019 Questions and Answers. At the very end of the show, the highlight, a prayer. Let us pray together because prayer can be most empowering. Let's stay there, enjoy this break, and right after it, we're going to listen to this beautiful segment. We will return to our program after these messages. 
and enjoy this new release. We're born for love by the renowned Brazilian scientist and researcher on reincarnation, Dr. Anani Andrade. This novel describes one of the most extraordinary and genuine cases of reincarnation ever studied by Dr. Andrade's Brazilian Institute of Psychobiophysics Research in Sao Paulo State. Order your copy now at roundtable.uk at gmail.com or at www.roundtablepublishing-uk.com. Spiritus Network, your gateway to on-demand Spiritus videos, www.spiritusnetwork.com. Spread the word, Kardec Radio, to learn more about Spiritism. Want to find a good way to explain life after physical death to kids or teenagers? Check out the book, Message from a Teen in the Spirit World, by the spirit Nail Lucio and psychographed by Chico Xavier. In this book, a teenager named Carlos explains his impressions on the new life in the spirit realm with his discarnate relatives and new friends. Purchase your copy online at www.ssbaltimore.org. The Spiritist Magazine is a trimestral, digital periodical that publishes the latest news on the Spiritist thought and the movement in the USA and worldwide. Subscribe now at www.spiritistmagazine.com. In the book, A Primer on Being Good by the Spirit May May, psychographed by the medium Shiko Shaviar, explains in simple language appropriate for children two paths in life, the path of good or the path of evil. God has granted us the freedom to choose either one. Purchase your copy online at www.ssbaltimore.org. Now we return to our program. So we are here, dear listening at Kardec Radio Studio talking about the spiritist therapy for discarnate spirit. And we have a friend, Dulce, uh, is here with us. Dulce Story, she's here with us. She is one of the founders of the Long Island, Island Spiritist Group in New York. And she's here with us to share some insights as well on the spiritist therapy for discarnate spirits. Thank you so much, Dulce, for being with us today. How are you? Very good. Thank you for the opportunity to be okay. here to, with you guys. So you, you uh, were just telling the, me about the, the some other insights that you have. You wanna, you'd like to share with us? Absolutely. Um, as we are uh, spiritists, understand the, the, how much the spirits can influence in our thoughts and even sometimes the way we act in life. And uh, it's very important to mention that uh, we do have uh, problems from previous life, which we bring with us to this life. And as well, in, in this very own lifetime, we uh, um, have uh, end up to creating more problems because the family we chose or the family we're supposed to be in uh, in order to help us to progress, ha we end up to, in the daily basis in life, we end up to uh, face some difficulties. And sometimes those difficulties, which we find in trying expiation this lifetime, can trigger a very uh, emotional imbalance of our life, perhaps even mental ill and et cetera. So it is important for us to understand the importance of the spirit. Uh, understand in need, and as well for us to uh, go to uh, re, um, to the resource of our science. For instance, for psychologists or psychiatrists or social work, uh, more with, uh, along with the work of the Spirit Center, look for the tools outside with uh, therapy or whatever is in need for your case. Each case is different. So, um, we can You're right, help. and and we want to say that you know here we're talking about the therapy for discarnate spirits, and we know though we cannot send them to a therapist or a psychiatrist, 
in the spirit yes, realm. Yes. We know that the spirits have those resources. They have spiritual clinics and spiritual hospitals as well. So that's a good reminder. Uh, though this is the this obsession of the discarnate spirits, we agree with you that actually for the incarnates when that's the case. And we talked about it, uh, Dulce, when André Cabral from uh, the Spiritist in New Jersey, he actually came here to tell us about the importance of uh, aligning uh, in the yes. exploration of science and spiritism. We thank you so much, Dulce, for being here with us at Kardec Radio today. Please stay on the line because we are going to stream right now a beautiful segment by our dear Marco and Joyce Magalhães from Canada. They are here, Spiritism in Your Life. They are going to talk about the Spiritist view on funeral and many other beautiful segments. Stay there, please, as we rejoice and nourish our souls with these messages. Hello, dear Kardec Radio listener. This is Marco Magalhães and Joyce Magalhães, and welcome to the segment Spiritism in Your Life. Today we're going to talk about how to behave during funeral, memorial, or burial services. You know that a funeral or a memorial service is a ceremony for celebrating or remembering the life of a person who has died. We have developed many rituals and traditions that are followed worldwide, but in many cases we forget about the basics, including the fact that we don't die, but only leave our material body to return to the spiritual life. And this, of course, has profound implications of what we should do during the ceremony. Andrea Louise explains in the book, Workers of Eternal Life, there are complex fluidic operations happening during the early 72 hours after the clinical death. Technicians and other spirits come to help the discarnating spirit to sever the fluidic bonds between perispiritual body and physical body. We can also find, in the Spiritist book, questions 320 to 329, that during this time, the discarnating spirit is, goes through a state of confusion where his thoughts are not completely clear and he most often does not fully understand what's happening. This also, of course, depends on the type of death, whether it's a traumatic, recent, or if there was a preparatory period for it, and the level of evolution of the spirit, including what they've done during their most recent incarnation. The spirit Jacob, through the medium Chico Xavier, brought to us a vivid description of what happens right after the physical death. We're going to read now a small section of the book that describes exactly what the spirit goes through during his funeral. Let's listen to it now. Not all thoughts gathered in that place translated into love and assistance. The personal opinions about myself differed about among the presence, forming a less sympathetic fluidic energy current. Some offered flowers I did not deserve, while others pelted me with lacerating thorns. It was a scenario of complex impressions. I wish I could materialize in front of everybody, begging alms of sincere prayer. How I asked for an opportunity to excuse my weaknesses, if my friends could forget my human errors and help me with prayer, naturally, this balance would benefit me immediately. Powerful resources would sustain my heart. But it was too late to teach them about their attitudes, charity and forgiveness. I thought of all people that have discarnated before me, experiencing the affliction and mental aggression, and that comforted me. A small group of incarnate friends attracted my attention. I walked to them, but I was forced to move away, disappointed. They were commenting on politics with an aggressive attitude, plunging their mind into unnecessary disputes. I found another group of people to whom I was deeply fond. I sought their company with my spiritual benefactors, but yet another disappointment awaited me. They were whispering about the likely cost of my burial, issuing a premature judgment. They involved my name in discordant and rude impressions. As you can see, my friends, this is a very clear, vivid description of how our thoughts and our actions and our attitudes during a funeral or a memorial could impact negatively or positively a spirit that's discriminating. And we decided to bring, again, a list of things that we should consider when we attend a funeral. So number one, most people are more worried about their clothes, candles, gifts, and other earthly things 
that are irrelevant to the discarnate spirit. The thoughts and feelings you carry inside you are the most important things to consider. Number two, focus on the good memories you have from the discriminating spirit. That is not the time to remember things that will further disturb him and maybe bring other unhappy spirits to the ceremony. Number three, this is not the moment for analyzing your actions, guilt, remorse, and if you believe in internal life, you will understand that you will soon meet that spirit again. Number four, avoid discussions or arguments regarding unsuitable topics including soccer, politics, gossips, and any others. Number five, share your good feelings and thoughts with the family members and friends so they can also benefit from your good energies. Number six, remember that this is not a social event. We should all direct our thoughts to help the discriminating spirit go through this moment. Number seven, remember that the discriminating spirits are almost certainly present during the ceremony and all your thoughts are direct to them are gonna be felt immediately. And number eight, the most important of all, pray. Because prayer is the most important thing you can do at this time. As the spirit Jacob describes to us in the book Volte. I was getting close to deep despondency when I observed in a vehicle not far away the formation of beautiful circles of light. Brother Andrade, answering my silent question, stated, In the car, we have the clarity of a sincere prayer. I reached the car and rejoiced. Some fellow incarnated spirit offered me the resources of sanctifying prayer. My delight and happiness was so enormous that I almost knelt down, feeling happy. That prayer, formulated to Jesus for my benefit and my peace, was a heavenly gift. The small group was emanating a comforting energy that entered through my soul like a balmy rain. That prayer influenced me sweetly. I believe that the newly discarnated almost always need the fraternal thoughts of brothers who are still incarnated. Thank you, my friends, and God bless us. talking about the introduction of the gospel according to Spiritism, there is a passage, number two, entitled The Authority Behind the Spiritist Doctrine and the Universal Control of the Spirit Teachings. In it, Allan Kardec explains that, quote, If the Spiritist doctrine were of a purely human conception, it would offer no more guarantee than the enlightenment of those who actually conceived it. But no one on earth could seriously contemplate the pretension of possessing the exclusive and absolute truth. You may ask us, why the dead? One of the answers could be, man's reason has been so strongly linked to all kinds of earthly interests, as it still is today, that only the dead had the unbiased freedom to answer some questions properly. Remember the spirit of truth that Jesus promised in the book of John? It's interesting that... Jesus has promised to send us particularly the spirit of truth and added that he would have to remind us of him. If we study the history of Christianity now, my dear listener, it's so clear that all these hundreds of years the message of the Lord has been mixed up with so many earthly interests that Jesus foresaw then that we were going to need something that reminded us of him again. Okay, all right. So the spirits have come to restore the truth by bringing us the principles and variables that we lacked in the interpretation of the gospel. But there is a problem, you to say. The Apostle John, the evangelist, brings up a true issue in his first epistle or letter, chapter 4, verse 1. Quote, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Well, we could go on in the reading of this important passage for, for a long time, but for now, let's bear in mind that regarding prophetic activities that are called in the Spiritism mediumship, we know that to search for the universal teachings of the spirits, we need to use high-level criteria, 
so that we are not deceived by a number of circumstances that may be huge obstacles in our pathway to truth. Yes, because as the Apostle says, try to listen to the spirits that come from God, the Holy Spirit, so to speak. How can we do that? How can we tell one from the other? My friend, the first criterion, the moral criterion, is all in the basic teachings of Jesus as we have been studying together. There is the use of the mediumship in the Spiritism, yes, there is, but its use is attached to the highest evangelic principles so that no medium, no master, no leader can mislead a group or community into something that goes against the reasonable in terms of the loving tenets of our Master Jesus. No matter how much power this medium may show, how much precision his or her skills may display, if it clearly goes against those higher principles that is not supposed to be spiritism, here's one of the paramount points that differs spiritism from other spiritualist doctrines. Number two, the operational and practical criteria. We can find it in the basic framework, our Kardex books, and many others received by what we personally call apostolic mediums. Of course, we still have lots to learn, but he, Kardec, devoted part of his life to put together an observational work that is essential for anyone of any religion or sect that deals with the afterlife truths and the communication with the spirits. In my personal experience, this is so true that not only once I received at my home at the hearings of some Christian denominations who were having extrasensorial experiences but did not have any knowledge on how to deal with those phenomena let alone when these phenomena somehow went against the dogmas of their sect. Well, let us explain the expression we used above, apostolic mediums. The Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 2, was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. See, my friend, there are many kinds of prophets or mediums but apostolic ones are never in great number, and it's fair to use as advice these works that come from apostolic mediums first, of course, because the apostle can more easily be tuned to higher spirits and realms of reality. The spiritist conclusion on this can also come from Paul, from the Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. He says, you might be filled with the knowledge of His will, Jesus' will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's why we need to study, pray, and be charitable, step by step. We'll wrap it up now with Kardec's words. Quote, Spiritism has no nationality and does not stem from any known cult that might exist nor is it imposed by any social class, seeing that any person may receive instructions from parents, relatives, and friends from the beyond. This is how it had to be accomplished, if it was to lead all mankind towards brotherhood. If it did not maintain itself in neutral territory, it would nurture dissensions instead of pacifying them. The force of spiritism, as well as the cause of its rapid spread, resides in this universal teaching. Thank you so much. We will return to our program after these messages. Would you like to liberate yourself from your life struggles or to find inner balance? The Inner Journey CD has three beautiful visualizations that will help you bring harmony to your life. As Joanna D'Angeli tells us to, live in a way that you leave enlightening footprints in your pathway as if they were stars pointing out the pathway to happiness. To find this CD, go to the bookstore on the Spiritist Society of Baltimore webpage, www.ssbaltimore.org, that is www.ssbaltimore.org. Dot .org and start your inner journey today. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio.
The International Spiritist Council is organizing and promoting the 7th World Spiritist Congress, which will be held in Havana, Cuba on March 23rd through the 25th of 2013. The Congress theme will be charity and spiritual education in building a world of peace. 150 years of the gospel according to spiritism. For more information, please visit www.the number 7 cem.org. And now we return to our program. Hello, dear Cardiac Radio listeners, and welcome back to The Spiritist Moment. I'm Kirsten DeMello, your host. We are coming to the end of our study of Part 3 of the Spirit's book, the chapter that's entitled, The Law of Reproduction. As we studied throughout this particular law, we learned about many things. We learned about the necessity to be prudent and wise when planning our family lives, when we are planning whether or not to have children, as we discuss in the book After the Storm, the use of contraceptives in family planning. We also learned about the succession and perfecting of the races from also the book On the Way to the Light by the Spirit Emmanuel, psychographed by Chico Xavier, talking about the races that disappear as new ones arise and more better prototypes are created. And we learned that, and we quote from Question and Answer 692, that the spirits tell us everything must be done to arrive at perfection. Humans themselves are instruments that God uses as a means for accomplishing the divine ends. And as we know, we read in the book, The Genesis by Alan Kardec, we know that and we quote that God incessantly watches over the execution of the divine laws and the spirits who populate space are God's ministers, charged with the details according to the attributions corresponding to their degree of advancement. So we know, dear listeners, that God watches over, always, incessantly, to make sure all of his divine laws are fulfilled. So he's a loving God, always watching over each one of us. And on the same tone, we learn from the Spirit's book, answered to question 693, that everything that hinders the operations of nature is contrary to the overall law, laws of nature and ultimately the laws of God, laws of nature, which are the laws of God. Something for us to reflect about, dear friends. As the good and noble spirits, along with the incarnate collaborators who put together the spirits book, they finalize this particular chapter on the law of reproduction with the idea of polygamy. What is polygamy? Well, it basically is when someone may have more than one wife or husband at the same time. And the spirits are so kind because they never judge and they never condemn us, but they just basically tell us the facts when they say that polygamy is a human law. And we quote from Answer 701, and abolishing it is a mark of social progress. They don't say, oh, if you participate in polygamy, you're going to die in the eternal abyss of hell. And they kindly just let us know, hey, it's not part of divine law, it's just a human law. And as we know, as always, human's law change depending upon the time and the customs. As the good noble spirits tell us here, that it's transitory, it passes. But they do, dear friends, they point out something very interesting, dear friends. They point out that polygamy, and in polygamy, there is no true love. There is nothing more than sensuality. And clearly in this particular chapter in the book, chapter 6, from the book After the Storm, entitled Sexuality, Joanna DeAngelis enlightens us on the topic of sexuality. And she tells us that, that there is a marked difference between happiness and pleasure, between physical sensations and authentic emotions. Quote, unquote, from Joanna DeAngelis in this particular book. So what is she telling us? That these physical sensations we are feeling during sex isn't necessarily love, although there can be love with sex, but she draws our mind something much more profound, which is the purpose and the point and how we should respect our own sexuality. In such an interesting text that she states on page 22, when she says that when sex came out to the public square of disrespect, when it came out of that Suppression, she says, it wanted to avenge the suffering it had endured 
presuming that its abuse would correct the errors of old repression. So it's interesting because at one point in time in history, sex and sexuality was very much suppressed and seen as impure. And now it went to complete other extreme in certain areas of life, in certain societies, and and certain social norms. We know he's gone to the other extreme. And as she says it, it's now regarded as a pleasure machine. And man's only purpose is to enjoy it rather than to regard it as a means to perpetuate the species. She wisely tells us that the problem of sex is a problem of the spirit. And in the spirit alone is a solution. So we cannot necessarily blame solely internet, TV, media. We must also look at the tendency of the incarnating soul and his his or her tendencies to which they are falling back into. That's why, dear listeners, dear friends, the education we give to our children when they are small and still growing and very malleable to ideas, higher uplifting ideas, to recalibrate their minds to attune themselves to more elevated things in life and not fall back into their old habits. So, dear friends, we will end on a note with these thoughts from Joanna DeAngelis, and she says, Should you find yourself in a state of sexual misconduct against the sanctifying purposes ascribed by our Creator, do not degrade yourself, even if modern times favor or applaud you. Preserve your moral energy and keep your balance. Whenever your burning desires flare up, resort to the soothing and lasting comfort of prayer. As always, dear friends, we leave you with these enlightening messages to comfort your soul and your hearts. And as always, we wish you many blessings. Welcome to our Yes, Youth Education is Presents on West Kardec Radio. I am Bernadette Leal, and I'll be spending a few minutes with you, inspiring to bring spiritual awareness and spiritual teachings to our youth, parents, and educators. Today, we'll continue talking about joy, and we will answer the following question. How can I teach my child about the joy of giving. Children learn by example. So in order for them to be joyful, they need to have parents that take their time to give and express joy as they give. True joy is so powerful that it is like a great movie you saw, a wonderful book you read, a delicious food you ate. You can keep it to yourself. You need to share it with your family and friends. Research shows that people have more joy in giving than in receiving. But why? In a study done by National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in Bethesda, Maryland, it was found that the act of giving rewards the brain because it activates the mesolimbic pathway which allow us to have some sensation of pleasure. We usually feel good when we exercise because we release endorphin, which is a chemical that helps us to fight stress, block the feeling of pain, plus the healthy benefits of it. But sadly, we do not often take the time to exercise the act of giving, which also releases a good feeling with the advantage of making a difference in someone's life. But besides a physiological reason, true altruistic giving is a result of love and compassion. It is selfless. Paul the Apostle, in Acts 20.35, emphasized the power of giving. He says, In all things I gave you an example, that so laboring you ought to help the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And Paul also says, Keep comforting one another and building one another up. So, if we still struggle in giving out of love, we should do it at least as a duty. 
And as we practice giving, we will be rewarding our brain and slowly moving toward compassion. Little children are natural givers. They love to give their time and talent to help mom and dad, their teacher, younger siblings, and friends. As a kindergarten teacher, I often see my five-year-old students excited about helping. And one thing that children love and can easily give are their skills. I usually pair students up so they can help each other sharing their talents by helping their friends with the letters and numbers, tie their shoes, take a friend to the office or to see the nurse, comfort when a friend is crying. And after practicing how to be a good helper, they now take the initiative to help one another when they see their friend in need, without me asking them for assistance. Another example that I can share was during the holidays. The students made an ornament, but two of them were absent, missing the chance to work on that art project. Then later in the day, one five-year-old boy came up to me saying that the absent students would be very sad about not having the ornament, and he offered to make it for them. I can't describe the joy of the little boy and the two students when they came back to school and found out that a friend had made the ornament for them. As parents and educators, we need to nurture this behavior of giving in children. Otherwise, as they grow up, they may become self-centered and desensitized towards someone's pay and need. We always provide to our children, but we need to teach them to provide to others and think about others as well. And create opportunities so they can practice giving. They can give their time, a helping hand, a smile, share what they can do, listen to a friend, give advice, something they made, and much more. It is also important that children put some effort on giving or on a charitable project they are working on, so they will give more value to their action. Plus, it will help them with their self-esteem and it will make them feel important. Sometimes, when we are facing challenges in life or feeling sad, we may have the tendency to withdraw, isolate ourselves, and dwell on the problem. But a good way to feel better and snap out of the troubled thought and negativity is to do something to help others. Instead, we should help the needy, offer to clean a friend's house, cook for someone who is sick, read a storybook to a child, and we will see that soon we will start to feel better. Also, spiritually speaking, as we are busy and move away from the negative thoughts, we will be more open to receive the inspiration from our mentors and think more clearly to work on what is troubling us. Helping others also makes us realize that there are people with more difficult challenges than us. There is a story of a teenage girl who was sad and suffered from depression, and she found out that the neighbor was in a hospital leaving her two little girls with their old grandmother and in need of help. The teenager and her mother went to the neighbor's house, and soon the daughter started to play with the little girls, read the stories, and helped to feed and put the girls in bed. When she came back home, the daughter was smiling and feeling happy, completely forgetting about her worries and the reason why she was sad. Then she asked her mother, if she could go back to the neighbor's house on the following day to help the little girls again. Chapter 13 of The Gospel According to Spiritism by Alan Kardec reminds us that everyone can give. Whatever your social is standing, you will always find that you have something you can share with another. 
from whatever God has given you. You owe a part to those who are less fortunate. For certainly, if you were in their place, you would welcome somebody else's kindness. Kardec Radio listeners, let us give and encourage our children to give, knowing that giving brings us great joy. Joy to our body, joy to our mind, joy to our spirit. Joy is an expression of the Creator and involves us in a high and positive energy. So, we would like to invite you to practice the joy of giving by doing the following. Today, or during the week, approach someone you know. It could be your spouse, your child, a friend, your co-worker, and ask, What can I do for you today? And you will see their surprise as you practice and enjoy the joy of giving. Thanks for listening to Yes. And if you have any questions that would like us to answer in this segment, please email them to Kardec at KardecRadio.com. Dear listener, you have been enjoying beautiful segments by Kardec Radio's team, and we are most grateful to them and to you. Right now, we're going to open the line to another caller who is here with us, Angela from the Hamptons. Hi, Angela. Thank you so much for being with us at Kardec Radio today. Hi. So, Angela, you have a question for us. Well, I had a question about a relationship or... Um, actually, I was really enjoying that that talk. That talk was really good. Um, do you ever just listen to something and, and then you don't have any more questions? That's wonderful. So that's the Golf Kardec Radio. You nourish your soul and then you're <laughs> replenished. That's great. So we we'll thank you so much for being with us today. And, you know, if you have any suggestions, just send us an email and we'll keep uh, informing and sharing the news, Okay. But that really spoke to me, what you guys were saying. That, that, that really spoke to me. That's wonderful. Many blessings to you, Angela. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, dear listener, here we are. And before the prayer, we are going to stream to you a beautiful, wonderful song. As we're talking about the discarnate spirits, spirits who are sometimes earthbound, either because they don't know they have already discarnated or because they are really in need of staying a little bit closer, their emotional needs, or because they are really holding grudges, unfinished businesses, and you know what? Spiritism can help them out. Read the book, Getting to the Light, The Spirit is Therapy for Discarnate Spirits by Nilson de Souza Pereira. You can get a hold of it at the bookstore of the Spiritist Society of Baltimore. And by the way, let us recall the beautiful study that was just released by the British Journal of Psychiatry. As we're talking about spirituality, mental health, and religion. A beautiful study, well put together, by Dr. Michael King and his group at the University College London. Just released the information that people who have a spiritual understanding of life in the absence of a religious framework are vulnerable to mental disorder. Read it in our Facebook page at Kardec Radio. We have more information about it. If you have more questions and answers, log on to kardecradio.com. Send us your question and answer. Let us listen to this beautiful song by James Moroda. They leave. And after that, We're going to invite you to our final prayer. Away with 
Dear listener, a lot really to be grateful for. How about now if we join our heart and minds once again to pray? Because prayer, as we've just heard from this very song, is really a way to get us to another frequency, another level. So let us picture a beautiful landscape. Whatever landscape you might prefer that makes you feel at ease and comfortable, more connected to God. Let us feel the presence of God and the joy of living. In these therapeutic moments, dear Father, Mother God, What a gift it is to exist, not only in the flesh, but in your universe. In the perspective of continuing progress, of learning always, never regressing, it really makes us feel so blessed, so fortunate. And by that, we rejoice and are truly moved by your providence, by your loving care. And yet, we don't know quite yet what it is to truly love 
but we are willing to to learn it, to share, and to put it into action. May we become ever more altruistic, charitable, thinking more of the needs of others than our own. May we open our hearts, whatever we are, our minds, to undiscovered reality. May we become ever more disciplined, fraternal, and loving. And as our dear Master Jesus have taught us, we now plead to you to forgive our debts as we also forgive the ones whom we think owe us something. Hopefully one day we won't think that anybody owes us anything because in fact As Spiritism teaches us, dear Lord, we realize that when we do something right or wrong, we do it first and foremost to our own selves. May we release and let go of any attachment we have in our lives so we can become more selfless and ever more caring. Thank you for the resources you have given us, for all the friends who have been helping these efforts at Kardec Radio in both realms of life, and for all who are at this moment on the earth in need, whether an incarnate or a discarnate individual. May they feel a loving embrace of yours together with our crumbs of light so they may feel less pain, receive a helping hand, and smile again. In your guidance, protection, and permission, We close these moments of reflection, of sharing, of nourishing of our souls, and so be it. Dear listener, in a week, as we come back, we're going to bring another friend to tell us more about the most beautiful journey, the inner journey, the journey of self-discovery. It is Eduardo Guimarães, a friend who is actually a very active spiritist in the New York City Spiritist Movement. Eduardo Guimarães is the president and founder of the Inner Enlightenment Spiritist Society. He's going to tell us about many of the spiritist teachings that guide us into the most important journey of all times, which is the journey of inner discovery, self-discovery. Come back and, you know, share the news. The Kardec Radio is here to nourish your soul. May God bless us all. Thank you for listening to Kardec Radio, broadcasting live every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Email us and share your comments at www.kardecradio.com. Until next time, we wish you many blessings.